All right. Can I, everyone hear me? Yep. All right. The, uh, uh, today's the uh, 2016 school board uh, candidate forum. Um, we're going to uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and then I'll announce the, uh, uh, the ground rules for today's uh, event. So if you please rise. Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> so, ground rules. For the candidates, uh, first off, no candidate has advanced knowledge of any of the questions, correct? Correct. <laughs> Since I was the keeper of the questions, that better be true. Uh, the same questions will be asked of each candidate. Uh, the time limit for each question will be announced when each question is asked. Uh, the moderator, or designated timekeeper, I am the timekeeper, um, will signal the candidate when there are 15 seconds left uh, so the candidate can wrap up their response. Uh, I will strictly enforce that time. I've got a beeper on here. I'll tell 15 seconds, but when it comes to the last five seconds, an annoying uh, five-second beeper will be coming. So I'm certain it'll make you nervous. Uh, but that's the time to pull it together. I will uh, alternate the order of which candidate uh, gets a question, uh, so that uh, it's not always the same person who gets the, first, you know, the question first. Um, please answer the questions regarding your own views and opinions. Um, We'd like to not critique someone else's views, um, and because you're really what you're trying to do is uh, uh, to tell the voters what you believe in. Uh, for the audience, uh, prepared questions for candidates are likely to take up most of all the available time. I have left two positions for any questions from the audience. Um, so if, when we get to that point, if we haven't gone over time, I'll, I'll in, uh, engage the audience if you have any questions specific. Uh, please do not cheer, boo, or uh, applaud, or talk, or otherwise disrupt the forum. Um, and uh, the school board rule is challenging, so ask yourself, do you agree with uh, their views or positions? Uh, are they articulate? Uh, can they answer questions directly within the time frame that is given? And, uh, and just uh, listen and, uh, uh, um, and, and evaluate the candidates for yourself. Um, Let's say, all right, let's introduce our candidates tonight. Um, first, we're, we have uh, Lindsay uh, the Liberty, um, and uh, has, is a mom, has three children attending Hooks at schools. Um, is, uh, let's see here. Uh, sorry, I should have gone through this. Uh, graduated from Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Works full time as a pharmacist and pharmacy manager at Hannaford in Goffstown. Um, and uh, let's go to the next here. Greg uh, Matakos, um, uh, president of the New Hampshire Chapter Institute of Management Accountants and current board member of the Manchester Area Human Resources Association. Um, is a father of a three-year-old boy who's a uh, driving force for why he's decided to run and uh, is seeking the candidacy um, and uh, is also a senior recruiting manager in accounting and finance uh, uh, in accounting and finance right. of course uh, our incumbent is uh, Alan uh, Watley um, Personal information, John Hopkins University, uh, graduate of Bachelor of Engineering, uh, Science and Chemistry. Um, worked for uh, DuPont um, at one time, and uh, also is involved in um, uh, was involved in different sports, taught physical chemistry, uh, physical science, uh, advanced in AP chemistry, and, at, and coach at Holderness School, and uh, the head of the science department at Mangale Bramford School, grades K through 12. So those are our three candidates. These, their uh, complete uh, uh, bio is on the uh, uh, library uh, website, so you can read them in detail. So since we're a bit pressed for time here, Mr. Chairman, yes, how many positions are we uh, are open? I'm just going to go through that. Yep, not a problem. <laughs> All right. So uh, first off, there's uh, two candidate positions for three-year terms, and then we have, of course, three candidates for those two positions, but they're three-year terms. All right. I don't understand. There's two seats available. Okay. And we have three candidates. 
Okay. Are so they all for the same length of time? Yes, we're all for the same for three years. Okay, so the two out of the three. Thank you. Correct. All right. Uh, let's see. First, um, I'm going to give you two minutes uh, each um, for uh, for in basic introductions. Uh, like basically, you know, do you have children in school? If so, where are they attending? What issue or challenge or topic motivated you to submit your name as a candidate? What uh, skills, strengths, and expertise will you bring to the board? So you have two minutes. So, so I guess we'll first go with uh, Greg. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I moved to Hooks in 2008. Um, I was a member of the police department for about 10 years. I uh, started in police work when I was 19 years old. Got out in 2010. I have an associate's degree in criminal justice, working on a bachelor's right now in human resources. Currently a senior recruiting manager uh, for KBW Financial Staffing and Recruiting. Uh, the driving force, as I mentioned in my uh, bio, is my three-year-old son. Um, we've decided that we're going to plant our roots in Hooksett, purchase our house. We currently own a condo right now here in town. Um, and have decided that Hooksett's where we want to stay, so we're looking to buy a house this year in Hooksett and stay here. And I want to uh, basically be a part of the going forward for my son, for the school district, uh, and for the other kids as well, uh, making sure that they get a proper education. Uh, we've given them the right tools that we need to move forward. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, uh, Alan. The reason why I've decided to <clears throat> run again, I think the next three years are going to be very critical in hooks at education. <laughs> The first thing that's going to happen is we've made a major move in technology to get our Chromebooks and other facilities into our schools. And next year, our schools will be one-on-one, -on -one, uh, six through eight, with uh, Chromebooks. Uh, in the next year, I would hope that we could do that also in the middle school and in the uh, Underhill, the K-2. to uh, With that, we need to support our teachers as we started last summer and providing them with the introductory background to be able to take advantage of those tools and bring them into our education. At the same time, when we bring in tools like that, we also have to think about the emotional and social issues that are involved with them. And so that's one of the reasons why it's not just academics, but it's also health concerns, emotional concerns, and social issues that we need to bring in as a part of this, and which we are doing. The next and another big thing that's going to happen in the next couple of years is our superintendent will probably be retiring. And I think it's extremely important uh, that we be able to continue the outstanding work uh, that he is doing and the great leadership that he has had, and particularly the uh, STEM and technology issues and their growth. And along with this, Many people say, well, STEM, of course, we know it's science, technology, engineering, and math. But what we don't understand is that it's the innovative, individualized education that is a key part of that, so that we can challenge all of our students to the best possible level. And it's for these reasons that I decided that I would like to continue, at least for these next critical three years. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Lindsay? All right. I um, have three kids. Max is in kindergarten, and we'll see if I make it out of kindergarten with him. And then I have Noah, who is Miss Margo. Margo's my middle one. She's in third grade, and in fourth grade is Noah. So um, really, I actually going back a couple years, I decided to join the PTA to be more involved, and it was through different discussions and working. Um, for them that I thought I need to do a little bit more, um, which is when I saw these openings, why I wanted to run for school board. Um, again, such change has happened in the past few years and that's what we need to continue. Um, obviously my children will need to go to high school and I want to keep that positive change going and the options there. Um, and I love the technology coming because these kids can outmaneuver any one of us probably with the technology. Um, so we need to have that and just keep them um, in the top, top of their class. So that, that's really why I'm running. All right, great. Okay, so now we get to the questions. All right, so just to give you a, a, a quick overview, these questions were submitted by uh, citizens. Um, uh, and what I've done is 
format them into uh, questions if they needed to be formatted into questions. Um, and, uh, and then I'll present them um, tonight. Okay. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, Greg, you're going to be the first one to start off. We'll go down to Greg, Allen, and Lindsay. And then it'll be Alan, Lindsay, and Greg for the next question, and so on and so forth until we get through. So the topic is uh, budgets and taxpayers. So uh, Greg, the first question is, and everyone can listen to this, I guess, um, approximately 35% of hooks at taxpayers are uh, retired individuals on fixed or retirement incomes. How would you find the balance between the needs and wants of the school district versus the limited resources of taxpayers uh, taken into consideration in 2016, there was no increase in the COLA for Social Security recipients. It's a really good question. Um, the current budget, uh, if I remember looking at it, um, that was being proposed to the Warren article, um, if I looked at it correctly, I saw about a $200,000 increase, I believe is what it was. Um, you know, that's a lot on a, on a fixed income, and I, I understand that. Uh, I think we have to weigh, as a school board, the, the needs of the students. Um, as well as the taxpayers, and making sure that our, our students and our, our kids are getting the best education possible while also taking into consideration the needs of the taxpayers. Um, you know, there's really no fine line in being able to, to tax at certain levels of income, unfortunately. Uh, if we could do that, that would be a great way of doing things. Um, so I think as a board member, you know, we really have to look at the budget in general and determine where you know, certain things are, are necessities and where things aren't. And I think that's really the appropriate way that we have to look at a budget and try to try to make sure we live within our means, if you will. We all have a budget that we live in every day as a, as a homeowner. Um, and I think we do that as a, as a person within my family. And I think as a, a school board member, we also have to do that when you're looking at the budget and taking those concerns into consideration and making sure that whatever we do look for increases, our actual needs that we can justify um, for the taxpayers, because it is a burden on people that live on fixed incomes, and I get that. All right, thank you. Alan, do you want me to repeat the question? No, thank you. All right. <clears throat> when you look at a budget, folks, there are two parts. You have the mandatory part and the discretionary part. If you look at the discretionary part of this year's budget and compare it to last, it's $100,000 less. But the mandatory items that we had no control over takes care of all of the increases in your budget this year. For example, we had 27 new students come in for special education this year. The average cost for a special education students is around $37,000 per year, folks. That's why that one item alone was a million dollar increase. We had no control over that. Why don't we? Because when we get that kind of, of a student, we have to send them to a state certified evaluator. That person then mandates the kind of education that has to be provided, whether it's in-house or out-of-house. That student, therefore, our regular students cost us maybe twelve dollars or $13,000 a year. But these students are usually anywhere from twenty dollars to 60000 You say, how, much? how can you be that way? Because we have some students that it's mandated that they have a full-time registered nurse attending them the whole time they're in school. This, this is not an option. So when you look at the increases that occurred in our budget this year, which was the health insurance increase, the uh, high school education costs, which are mandated, we have to pay for these kids to go to high school and transportate. You look at those items alone, folks, you will see that all of the dollars in those is the increase in your budget this year. We actually took the budget, the school board is, that was given to us by the principals the teachers, the principals, and then it came to the school board. After the superintendent evaluated, we actually cut out about 600000 from that. And some of those things were technology areas that I personally felt like they were cutting them out of my heart because I knew that was going to affect our students. So if you don't think we're doing the budget job, folks, we are trying to do the best we can. Do you want me to repeat the question? But no, no. Um, I think not having all the background, as Alan did, really going forward, what I would like to see and to make sure that we can <coughs> help those on a fixed income. And for those of us that, yes, we might get the increase each year, but again, you have to balance and budget your house. 
Um, I think we need to be clearer on what the costs are, why the increases are happening. Um, I think that was a lot of kind of the debate this this um, winter on the budget was just not having it clearly laid out. Um, we cannot do anything about the special special education costs, so they just need to be in there in case those children, new ones come in and to continue with those that we already have. Um, but I know as a taxpayer, that was really my question, wanting to see it laid out so that I could support the increase, because it is, it is an increase. Um, and then also to think that we need to cut where we can because these kids are going to be taking care of us when we're on those fixed incomes. So we, we need to make sure that they are well educated and, and ready and um, can also help us balance that budget when they get to that time in their life. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go to question number two. We'll start with Alan. Okay, in accordance with the New Hampshire Department of Revenue, when offering a budget to taxpayers, all items must be identified and appropriated within the budget. Under what circumstances would you support using available year-end fund balance money for expenditures not appropriated in the budget or approved by the voters, i.e. non-emergency items? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be in favor of any money that was not uh, put in the budget uh, just arbitrarily being allocated for something. What I, would prefer, what I would prefer to do is what we have offered in your warrant article. The state of New Hampshire has decided that one of the things that Board of Education did not do was have uh, funds available for rainy day. Like last year when the, uh, the heating system over at Cali School went and the, uh, the ethylene glycol was all over the building and we had to clean that up. That wasn't in the budget. And that cost major dollars. We don't have a major repair fund. We've been lucky because our schools are relatively new and we haven't had a problem. But the legislature last year said that we can take, if we should have up to 2.5% maximum left over at the end of the year, that we could take a maximum of that and put it into a fund which could handle something like that but only be able to use that money if we went to the voters and said this is exactly what we're going to do with it and it's not a budgeted item it's a surprise item we didn't expect this to happen but these things as our school gets older these things are going to happen folks and when and it's not in the budget we don't have an opportunity to have that kind of a fund and i look at that fund as a major uh, major fund for for major expenses that are totally unexpected we should have to ask the, the taxpayers to use it when the time comes, but if the money's available, I think we should be able to use it for that, and only that. Um, yeah, I really, uh, especially if um, Warren Article 9 go does pass, I could not see a reason to be using that money either. I think um, the best would be to put, you know, get it back. And um, the only time, assuming that this doesn't go through, would be for a major catastrophe to happen at one of the schools that we needed it. And again, then it would be decided upon by the town. Thank you. Uh, Greg? So in regards to the, uh, the, the fund, if you will, I'm also um, a supporter that you know, we, could, we should be giving it back. Um, I understand that you know, if we have some expenditures that this is voted upon and we have uh, that fund that's created, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that we need to make sure we govern that and how it's used and make sure it's used appropriately uh, for, you know, emergencies and emergencies only. Uh, and then what classifies an emergency? Uh, an emergency to you may, might be different to you as opposed to me. Uh, and I think we'd have to classify, you know, what is an emergency? Is it extreme? The, the roof's collapsing, like the boiler goes. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily things that we could use. I don't want to use that fund for, uh, we need laptops that we didn't get the funding for the budget and that becoming kind of a slush fund because when you do that, um, you really lose the trust of the voters in that. Um, so I really do think it's, it's good if you use it appropriately and it's governed appropriately. Okay. All right. All right, very efficient. All right, um, let's see. All right, now we're gonna move to uh, the next uh, uh, topic, uh, which is going to be uh, uh, K through eight education. Uh, so uh, Lindsay, you're going to start, and then I'll go to Greg, and then Alan. 
So the uh, first question under that uh, segment, you've got uh, two minutes to answer. Uh, the last three years have been dominated by high school issues. As candidates for a school board, would you advocate for a shift in focus towards K through eight? And where do you believe improvements need to be made? All right. Um, I, I think we're well on our way. One of the big topics I think needs to be researched is full day kindergarten which I, I believe there is a committee already established looking at that. Um, and in doing that, we need to make sure that we're looking at everything, not increasing costs too much, but also not increasing class size, um, things like that. But I think that is, through K through 8, that is one area that um, we're lacking in a little bit for our kiddos. Um, the other thing would be to evolve and keep working with the STEM program. Now, I'm not sure exactly how the letters fit in, but now they're adding art. Um, so to make sure that we're incorporating the science, technology, is it engineering, math, and art, and um, really focus on that because the kids just are embracing it. And I don't even think that they know that they're learning um, and doing that. So um, I believe those are the two areas probably would fill up the three years pretty good. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, same question, correct? Do you want me to read the question? I uh, know, I'm good. Um, as far as K through eight, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, I know we have a committee into the full day uh, kindergarten right now that's being looked into and uh, is being evaluated. Um, you know, I think it's something that if, if it's done properly and it works and the committee feels that it's a good good tool, then absolutely we should, we should do that. I know it becomes an issue of trying to find where we're going to do that, funding, etc. And it's probably still another year or two down the road, but it's something we would have to think about. Um, one of the other things I think that uh, is really important with uh, K through eight is really just looking at a child and making sure that we're teaching them properly. Um, one of the things that I see, everybody kind of learns differently. Um, I'm not the type of person that can pick up a book, read a book, and then tell me to go do something. I'm the type of person that's very hands-on, and it's making sure that we identify what the child needs in their way of learning, as opposed to this is the way we do things and it's the only way to do it. Um, I think we really need to look at the bigger picture on education with the child and what really is their driving factor and what, what challenges them. Um, not everything in school challenges one child, but might challenge another. Um, and what challenges this child may not challenge that child. And it's really identifying what works with the children. Um, and with that, though, we have to also make sure that the class sizes are proportionate with the, the uh, teachers, making sure that they're identifying those type of needs so our children are getting the best education and learning the best way possible, as opposed to being labeled because somebody just really hasn't taken the time to pay attention to what makes a child learn. Um, and I can say that because, as I said myself, I'm not somebody that can read a book and learn. I am very hands-on. Um, and I think that uh, that's a good way to look at things, identify the child and what works for them. Okay. Number one, folks, we have to prepare our kids to be successful in their high school choices. What that means is we need to be sure that before they leave our school, they are comfortable with their Chromebooks, they know how to do the resources, and get information that they need to be successful. Right now, we're not doing that. That's why next year, that's our big push because we found that we're competing against schools like Candy and others that are already one-on-one -on -one in, in these technologies. And when you see these kids go to Pinkerton where they are one-on-one, -on -one, you walk in there and you see Bow High School, our kids have to be prepared to be successful, not only in high school, but in life. That's the first criteria. The second thing is, when you're doing that, you need to individualize your education. And that's one of the beauties of STEM, folks. All you have to do is go back and look at two weeks ago, the Board of Ed meeting, which is online, and you'll see a STEM presentation that was done from K to, from K to 8. And you see the individualized educational opportunities and how the kids were working on different sets of projects. In other words, instead of in your science, instead of in your science class or let's say a social studies class, but just providing a topic, you say, for example, um, study some, some a scientist, uh, Pasteur or uh, Newton or Galileo or what have you, uh, 
this is an opportunity for them to be able to go into their Chromebooks, be able to go to their media specialists, and to be able to gather the appropriate information so they can research that, and then be able to come back in the science class connected to that class. You see, STEM just doesn't occur in the science classes. It's across the board. So they can come back into their subjects, and they can use that in science. They can provide an experiment, for example, that to illustrate that particular scientist. So they can, if they want to be in medicine, they can choose somebody like Pasteur. If they want to be in physical science, they can choose somebody like Newton in motion. And this is what we need to be able to do, and this is what this, this whole idea of this one-to-one, -one, Chromebooks and the resources, and through our library specialists and through our technology. Five seconds. Yeah. The next thing that we need to do, folks, is we can't forget about training the teachers. And that's what we started doing last summer, and that's a critical part of it. If our teachers don't know how to use these technologies, our students aren't going to learn how to use them, and we're going to be spending money that won't be useful. We've got to prepare our teachers. Time's up. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll go to the next question. And um, are we make it uh, right from gone through? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, sorry. Lost my track. All right, uh, the next question actually all of you have hit upon. So I'm going to modify this question as just a yes or no. Um, just a um, uh, yes, no question. Okay? All right, number four. Um, and I'm going to start off with one subject matter. I'm not saying that you're in favor of this subject, I'm, it's the end piece that I'm more interested in. I, I shouldn't say we're all interested, but it's the question that's been given to us by uh, the community. Common Core Standards. Uh, which our federal government mandate are based on the premise of full full day kindergarten. What's your position on implementing full day kindergarten? Looks at so I, I guess uh, the answer. What I'm looking for, I guess, on this one is since you guys have really kind of verbalized it, is yes, you're in favor of it, or no, you're not in favor. Of it. And uh, we'll start out uh, with Lindsay. Yes, yeah. yes, I'm definitely in favor of full day full day kindergarten. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. Al. Well, all I can say is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes or no? Well, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of it, but I have a qualifications. All right. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next question, which is once again two minutes, um, and uh, this is uh, uh, deals with the Alps program, and this was uh, handed in by a constituent. Um, uh, I should say, actually, I'm not an office, so I can it. It was by a citizen. Um, the Alps program uh, began as a means to provide an advanced learning program for students who excel in math and reading. The program was debated in prior years as losing its focus, expanding too broadly, and lacking measurable, tangible results in terms of improved scores and student learning. As a board member, ensuring student success at all levels in school means establishing a policy for holding administrators, teachers, and other staff accountable for the quality of work directly impacting student achievement. What types of reporting would you seek as a school board member to ensure that you're informed with tangible and challengeable evidence of progress to ensure that students are benefiting from these types of programs. So we'll start off with Greg. So regarding the uh, the question, you're looking for the, the reporting measures that were in here? Yes, yeah, so as, as a board member, what kind of reporting would you would you like for, um, in order to evaluate the the performance of those programs, are they working or not working? Okay. Well, I think, you, again, you'd have to take um, each student um, and how that's going to be measured. Again, we got to look at the testing procedures that are going to be used, how the metrics are set in place, and then we have, we'll have to look at the metrics to see what the national standards are for, for school system, same level, same grades, and then determine are these systems working and the types of metrics that are in place. I'm not 100% familiar with these, so I'm kind of trying to fly by the, the, what I think this might be uh, where you're going with this. Um, is, is testing to make sure, is this kind of like the ESSA, no student, or every student succeeds um, plan is where I, I think this is going. Um, and I think you have to take each student and measure their, their progress. And it's going to be by subject line, or by subject, so English, math, and then do, uh, I, I guess, I guess you'd have to probably look at the metrics for each subject, the grade level, and then determine um, the means. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. Sure. All right. Uh, next, uh, Alan.
First of all, the ALPS program. And one of the things that if you go to a school board meeting tomorrow night, you're going to hear me say, I think we should eliminate the prerequisite that we currently have for students being able to take the ALPS program. And I'll, I can get into great deal of details about that later if you wish. One of the advantages of the one-on-one -on -one Chromebooks, folks, is that once a student and a teacher have agreed on a particular set of goals, the teacher has the ability at all times with this system that we're setting up next year to be able to go into that student's Chromebook, see the level of progress they're making, and to be able to interact with that student if necessary. The student also has the ability through that system to be able to pose questions to the teachers as is necessary to continue their progress. This is individualized education, folks. The next thing that we have a problem with is the Aspen program. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Now, the Aspen program is a way that teachers can input data so that uh, parents and students can both see, monitor progress and see how their students are doing. And, and this, again, requires going back to the teacher education to make them technologically aware of how to successfully use this program because it costs about 100000 bucks or more. But I think we need to do that, and if we can put these things together, which is what we're trying to do next year, folks, train our teachers so they can use these tools, okay. give the tools, okay. you've got it. Um. Go ahead, <laughs> All right, uh, Lindsay, do you want me to read the question through again? Mm, no. You're good? Right. We're good. Um, yeah, I have to agree. I really don't know a whole lot about the reporting of this. Um, and I think a lot of people question, even with a regular school, we go, everything's based on tests, which I don't think are necessarily the best way to show what a child is actually learning. Um, I think there definitely needs to be some reporting, whether it's from the teachers, um, maybe even from some of the students themselves, um, because those that are enrolled in ALPS, there's, there's not, to my understanding, not just a test to say, okay, you, you bet that, let's go do the next thing. These guys are challenging themselves, so there's not going to be, you can't say we're at 80%, so let's, I'm assuming the question's coming around, do we keep the ALPS program? Is it worth the financing? Is it? We need to modify it. So I don't know. I think I would like some to see something from the educators who understand the program better and what um, different levels they're hoping that the students achieve. I think if we looked long term, we could probably see are these students um, completing college courses in high school, maybe at a greater um, number than some of the other students. But that would be years we'd have to follow these students to see the outcome and then try to tap it back to the Alps. Okay. All right. All right. The uh, last question in the uh, K through 8 section um, is this. From a, all right, and uh, let's see, we're going to um, start from, uh, let's see, uh, Alan, right? Whatever, right. then Alan. All right. From a policy perspective, how do you believe uh, that teacher effectiveness uh, should be measured in our K-8 program? Should student assessments be considered in teacher evaluations? About three weeks ago, your SAU board, uh, based upon a, a, almost a full year of, of working, uh, headed up by your principal of your uh, Cowley School uh, came up with a, a, a whole new teacher evaluation program, which I, th I think does all of the things that that question implies, uh, that essentially are going to set up criteria that the teacher will establish uh, with their students, which will be evaluated by the appropriate department person, be it Becky, if you're talking about math or technology, you'd be talking about Ken or what have you. Uh, to make sure that these are realistic goals and that the achievement of those goals uh, will be a part of the uh, evaluation of the teachers. And uh, I, I think this maintains the idea of individuality of education, uh, challenging people, the students at their best areas 
and providing goals which are measurable in the teachers. Now, at the same time, we also have these smarter balanced tests, folks. Now, if you looked at the results for Hooksit, you found that we were very high ranking in the upper school in both math and science. In the middle schools, uh, we were uh, in the upper half with the, uh, uh, the English and, and that aspect of areas. We were a little weak in math. That's an evaluation. That's something that our teachers are being head, accountable, accountable for. And that's one thing that your math department head, Becky, is actually focusing on this year. And she's done an intermediate uh, training programs this summer. She has another one coming up. I think it's in either uh, end of April or May, a reevaluation of how that procedure is going. But we do want to get better. And that is a definite objective this year, is to improve our Smarter Balance testing. And do I think Smarter Balance testing is the answer? I think it's a darn good criteria, and it's a lot better than ECAP, which we had before. Much better. But can we go higher than that? Absolutely. All right. Um, I, I think this is a great idea, actually. But I, I heard this a little bit different than just our tests, because I think educators, when given the guidelines, can do a very good job of teaching to that test. Um, and there's a lot of students that are not excelling at these tests, and it's, it's really not showing an overall effectiveness of the educator. Um, you know, I, I actually just did my yearly reviews for my technicians, and I always say to them when they look at me with a constructive criticism, and I say, this is nothing new. We've gone through this. Nothing on an evaluation should be a surprise. Um, so to get the feedback of the students throughout the year or multiple times so that then the um, department heads can go in and intervene or help or, you know, celebrate achievements, I think it's a great idea. Now, how we actually do it, not too sure, because we'd have to teach the kids along the way, because everybody's very good when they're upset of speaking out, or if they love something, they like to speak out. But to just give an overall rating, I think, would be a little hard. Okay. All right. All right, um, at this juncture, um, I'm going to answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I, I agree. I think uh, you know assessments and having the students do assessments as well. I mean, um, it, you can you can teach towards getting certain grades on student assessments. That can be done. Uh, it, it's almost like when you talk about performance evaluations in your own job, you almost do know what's coming in your performance evaluation, uh, and you can do just enough to get a good performance evaluation. But to get that from another aspect as well as talking with the students and assessing, and it can be when you go. For instance, if you go to a training course at work and you get a, 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 an assessment at the end, how was your instructor? Um, there's nothing wrong with getting that and kind of giving you the feedback on how a teacher might be as well. Um, yes, the grades on these assessment tests that they take are also a key indicator as well, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with, with talking to your students. How's your teacher? How's, how are things going in class? And getting a good general overall assessment of where things are. Now we're at the point where we're moving in. All right, um, at this point, uh, I think we have uh, some room for any questions from the audience. If, you, if anyone has a question, don't be shy. Anybody? Uh, Tara? Yeah. Um, I don't really have a great note, but I was curious if you could share um, leadership experience and your ability to work collaboratively, any um, experiences that you could share. Oh, we'll start off with Okay. Um, as far as leadership, um, I have been a pharmacist for 15 years and um, with Hannaford for gosh, I'm on, about 10 years now. So probably about the 15 years, I started just floating around and then I ended up in a busy store where I was thankfully um, promoted to pharmacy manager which was eye-opening to me because I thought I would just keep doing my job and write a schedule. Um, and really it's not. It's working with um, the store, working with customers, um, leading my team to meet goals set before us, um, and working with lawmakers just all over the board. So and, um, really having to pull together and make sure 
that we are working as a team um, to get to those goals. So that is one area where I've um, been a leader. Just on a little scale, I am a Girl Scout leader, which is fun, and it's a whole new room because there's 11 girls and they just all talk at once and they run around. Um, so to try to keep them together, and I am not, by any means, I, I could not survive this an actual teacher with 20 of the little kids running around. Um, and then I think, too, just being a parent, you have to be a leader. You have to be able to correct wrongs. You have to teach, you know, just um, going way back. You have to teach them how to eat, how to walk, how to talk. Um, so that's, and then you had a second part of the question. Working collaboratively. Oh, yes. Well, am I out of time? <laughs> 15 seconds, go ahead. Uh, just over the years, yes, of course, certainly with work and with the PTA, um, trying to pull the different areas of the town together, working with the youth athletic program with the PTA, and now hopefully the school board working collaboratively. Great. All right, uh, Greg? So I was a sergeant in the police department. I attained that after uh, my third year um, on the police department. And I was a sergeant there for about seven years, leading a team of anywhere from three to five people. Uh, my current role now, I've been with this company for five years. I was prom promoted to senior recruiting manager uh, within the first year of being there in an industry that I've never done before. Um, as far as working collaborative, collaboratively with a team, I do that on a daily basis. Uh, I recruit right now for accounting and finance professionals CFO, VP of finance levels for companies like Comcast, PC Connection. Uh, so I'm working with senior level executives at many companies on a regular basis, uh, working collaboratively day in and day out, trying to find the right people for their teams, uh, as well as trying to maintain my team of seven people at work uh, and trying to work with them cross-functionally to make sure we all find the right candidates for these people. Um, I think uh, I'm also the president of the Institute of Management Accountants for New Hampshire chapter. Uh, and current um, board and director for Manchester Area Human Resource Association. Uh, and I've been actively involved in a lot of different functions within the, the state, if you will, uh, both um, trying to raise donations for functions uh, to attaining you know, laptops for other, other places where uh, we have a company that was hurting and didn't have it in their budget line. And uh, through the IMA, we were able to go ahead and do stuff like that. Um, so using my connections and networking. Um, that's it. All right. All right, Alan. My whole life has been in leadership. Uh, my first job uh, as an engineer for DuPont, I was there for a couple of years, and then they made me coordinator of manufacturing developments, where I would have to coordinate with the research department on new ideas, and then with the engineers who were going to design the equipment and facilities to do it, and then the actual construction and building and putting it into production. Uh, the key on all of these things is to be a good manager, you have to be a good facilitator. You have to understand each of your people and their strengths, and you have to provide the necessary support to make those people, help them to feel comfortable and successful. Uh, the, you look at my resume and you'll see, in, my, in school, for example, I was head of the science department from K to 12. Um, when, I, when I, was, I was brought into the department because a school had been unsuccessful in uh, science and yet expended great money in their facilities, and they wanted, it, uh, they wanted more students, particularly girls, to be successful. Within five years, we doubled the upper school enrollment. We ended up, as the, in the city of New York, we ended up as the number one in uh, chemistry achievement and established uh, programs for our seniors in conjunction with Rockefeller and other universities to do independent research as high school students. Um, I was uh, sales manager for the industrial chemical division of Johnson & Johnson. I was the uh, product manager for an uh, investment firm. Uh, in volunteer work, I've been director and president of the uh, boat, my boat club. I've been a trustee of trust funds in two towns. 15 seconds. Etc. I've been manager of, well, you, you, it doesn't, it goes on and on. But anyway, <laughs> that's what I do. All right, thank you. All right, so 
let's move on to uh, the next uh, subject line, which is going to be. Uh, oops, oh, you, you have a question? I had a question. Hopefully, it can be answered. Quickly. You know what? Um, let's let's have it. Sure. Okay. Uh, it sounds as if you have the districts in the Northeast Part of the state have the ultimate goal is to provide a virtual IEP for each student. Considering that, what sort of support does a teacher have in his or her classroom? Are there tutors? Are there aides? Is there anyone to assist the teacher with, uh, on the average, how many students? Per 20. Class? 20? Roughly. Give or take. Okay. Um, and that, it's a very good question, but as moderator, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, to at least two of the candidates aren't familiar with, they're running for the first time uh, for this position, okay. so they wouldn't have insight in terms of uh, the, what strategic aspects that are in place. Uh, Alan is an incumbent, so he's been on the school board, so he'd be got more information on that. That would be a great question, though, for the school board, um, which has a meeting tomorrow, correct? Yes. Um, at uh, Colley Middle School. But an excellent question, but I, I, I don't want to give uh, one of the candidates here a upper hand in regards Why to answering not? that. <laughs> 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 the question's a little bit different. All right, uh, I'll entertain one more question, Peter. Your, uh, <clears throat> your relationship with the superintendent. Uh, I've often, the uh, dealings I've had with the school board, I've always been concerned about whether they're getting the whole truth and nothing but the truth from the teachers and or the department heads. It, just shortly, your relation, how you view your relationship, if you get elected, with a superintendent. And I realize you're not educators, and, and that's one of the hard, the hard things, but you've got to be able to take a position on your relationship with a superintendent accepting his facts or just, just a short. All right, um, uh, uh, Peter is, uh, or Mr. Farwell is uh, uh, hit upon one of the questions on my list. Yep. So how about this, uh, in, in light of that question, let's all accelerate to that because uh, um, <clears throat> I think that the, it gives a good, uh, it, it's a good question, all right? So uh, Greg, you'll start out, um, and that'll be Alan and Lindsay. The question uh, that was on the list here, which was, please provide, or excuse me, please explain your understanding of the distinction between the school board's responsibility and the superintendent's responsibility. Sure. Um, my feeling is that he, he works for us. We are the, the governing board. Um, those that do know me know that I am a firm believer in getting the facts and standing behind the facts. Um, I don't like to just go with whatever people tell me because that's what somebody says. Um, I do want to get the facts. I like to get all my facts before I make a decision. Um, and with that said, you know, if what he is telling us uh, is something that we need to do, I want to make sure I have the facts before I make a decision. Uh, if we don't have the facts, I'm not just going to yes something because somebody's telling me to yes something. I usually stand behind my, my facts and make sure I have the right uh, facts in mind before I make a decision. All right. The superintendent is your executive officer. Um, one of the things that you will, if you become a member of the school board, is that you will have to check. You will have to be able to be able to sh be sure that the kind of information and that the knowledge of your superintendent is good, is thorough, and is in keeping with his principles. Uh, his department heads and so forth. I can tell you this about your superintendent. You have a gem. This guy really communicates with his people. This is a team. I have never found our superintendent, when we've asked him a question in a meeting, that he has not either known the answer, and when I've checked it myself and looked into it and talked to people, he's right on. But when he doesn't know the answer, he comes back and says, I'll look into this, and I'll get back to you. And he does. The biggest thing we're going to be losing in a couple of years is one terrific superintendent, folks. Oops. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay? Okay. I think... Um 
if I were elected, my role is on school board would be that I am I am here for a voice for the town, for the kids, for the parents, for the community. Um, whereas the superintendent is working for the town, he is the liaison between was it the four different towns, all working together. Um, yes, he certainly or he or she in a couple of years would know and have the facts, but again, yes, you need to check them. Doesn't mean we have to agree with him or her, um, but that we really are figuring out what's best for the town. Okay. All right, All right. Uh, let's move to the uh, high school questions, uh, which are uh, who's on to. Um, but um, this was uh, one from a, cons uh, from a citizen um, for this year's uh, warrant. Uh, Article 4 of the warrant is a request of voters to approve a contract for Manchester. Within the proposed contract um, under consideration, um, under approval and accreditation, the language allows Manchester to be under approval or conditional, conditionally approved under uh, ED 306.28, which is an RSA, um, or alternatively approved by the state Department of Education under Alternative Method of Compliance, ED 306.29. Whereas Pinkerton contract requires full compliance to state standards. As school board members, allocating budget for high school education with taxpayer money, do you agree that having two different accreditation and approval standards within uh, contracts is appropriate? And how would you advocate for students if one receiving district doesn't have to meet the most stringent state standards? Would you say again that last part that you just said didn't get it? Certainly. Um, well, I'll start with it. As school board members allocating budget for high school education with taxpayer money, do you agree that having two different accreditation or approval standards within a contract, within contracts, is appropriate? And how would you advocate for students if one receiving district doesn't have to meet the most stringent state standards? And we'll start with Alan. I think the, 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 the clarification. The, the contracts that we have uh, do have minimum requirements that they specifically state they have to meet the state of, of, New, of New Hampshire's education department minimum requirements. What you have to understand, folks, is you're, you're not talking about apples and apples. You're talking about apples and peaches. For example, if you, we, this is why we have six choices. If you look at Manchester, a student can look at Manchester and say, well, they have the, probably the best STEM program. They have an outstanding a drama, and they have outstanding band opportunities. They also have one of the best AP uh, uh, course achievement levels in the state. Now, you can pick those things. On the other hand, you can talk about Pinkerton, and you can talk about uh, there's a number of things that they do better. For example, if you're in creative, um, uh, instead of getting a conventional degree, you want to become a, a welder. You can go over there to that school and you can end up come graduating with a certification as a welder. And so each, that's why we have six choices. And that's why we bring those people here to a night when the parents and the students can go talk to them so that they can see that this school does this, Bo does something else. Each one of these schools has their specialties. And as far as I'm concerned, if you choose those specialties and the fact that they all do have to meet the state requirements and all our MOUs and our contracts, that's in there. That's why we broke the previous contract with Manchester because they didn't meet it. But now they have come back to stand. They have tentative approval in only one school. That's West. But that's supposedly being resolved. So we do have that in the contracts, but at the same time, you've got to understand what these seven offer our students and what the parent, what the opportunities are, immense. Nobody else in the state of New Hampshire comes close to what we do for our high school students, folks. Nobody. At the cost of about eleven thousand dollars a student. That's incredible. That's two thousand or three thousand less per student than anybody else has got in the state. And you got more options. Great. Uh, Lindsay. Can I be the past and ask you to repeat it? One yeah, more time? Absolutely. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, the. Um, in Article uh, 4 of the warrant is a request of voters to approve a contract with Manchester. Within the proposed contract, um, under approval and accreditation, 
The language allows Manchester under approval or condition or to be approved or conditionally approved under ED 306.28, and that's just an RSA uh, that covers conditional uh, conditional uh, approval, um, or alternatively approved by the State Department under an alternative method of compliance in ED 306.29, which is something that's even further. Um, this is, uh, whereas the Pinkerton contract requires full compliance to, to sta the, the standards. Um, so, and it says, uh, so as school board members allocating a budget for high school education with taxpayer money, do you agree that having two different accreditation and approval standards within contracts is appropriate? And how, and how would you advocate for students if one receiving district doesn't have to meet the most stringent state standards? Um, just reading through the Manchester uh, agreement, it seems to me like we were making it just one more school, or actually three, if you read it, um, for these kids to choose. So I don't feel like we're compromising their education. And it's certainly being accredited by the statutes and by the New England Association for Secondary Schools. So me as a parent or a student, if I want to go to Manchester, as a budget, it's costing us the same, which is listed in here. We are going to be telling Manchester by a certain date how many children will be going, kids. Um, so it's not taken away. We're not paying more for a lesser school. If I really felt that Central or West was the best fit, this is really just giving us one more avenue to go. Um, so I, I you know, and I think the state as a whole would have a big problem if any of the, the schools could not meet accreditation. I think that would rectify itself before it even got to our kids because the schools do have to pass accreditation. All right. Uh, Greg? Yes, I, I agree. I, it's funny, when I decided to run, I had at least a dozen people. The first question they asked me is, where do you stay with Manchester? Um, I've always been... The, the one person that would be, I'm for both schools, both Pinkerton and Manchester, so long as they make sense. It's cost effective. Um, now I understand maybe the, the credit, Manchester accreditation might be a little different than Pinkerton, but that's for the parent to decide on whether they want to send their child there. Having that, that notion in mind that the accreditation might be a little bit less than Pinkerton. It's no different than the accreditation being a, or the school system being a little different in both, where now we have Goffstown, um, which is another avenue for us. You know, Hooks, it's very unique where we have so many different schools to choose from, which has actually made it an attractive town for a lot of people to come to uh, because of the fact that we have so many different school systems to choose from. Uh, I'm in favor of, uh, once we have a signed contract of, of this going through, and the parents are the ones that make the decision of whether they want to send their kids to Central or West or whatever school system they decide they want to send them to. Um, so I'm in favor. All right, All right next question. Okay, next question. Um, with the approval of the Pinkerton contract last year, the anticipated calculation of the minimum number to be assigned to Pinkerton at year three will come about during your term in office. How would you envision the process to ensure that the Pinkerton minimums are met at the point in, at that point in time prior to allowing students to choose other options? And start out with uh, Lindsay. I don't, I don't think meeting the minimum is going to be a problem. As we're starting to send <coughs> our freshmen to Pinkerton, um, unless something big happens, most of those students, that's going to become their community, and that's where they're going to want to stay. Um, so as these students really get into the high school, um, I guess I just don't see the minimum. Our kids, our numbers are increasing. We're not getting any smaller, so we're going to need to be sending these students um, to high school, and I think they're just going to want to stay once they've made that their, their home. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Greg? Yes, uh, without having the numbers in front of me of where, where the students are right now for Pinkerton and who's going to Manchester, it's kind of hard to, 
to answer that. Um, my understanding is that we are far exceeding the numbers for Pinkerton at this point. Uh, so I agree that I don't think it's going to be an issue in the near future. Um, you know, the kids are already going to Manchester if they want to go to Manchester. They're going to Pinkerton if they want to go to Pinkerton. The only difference that we have right now is adding Gosstown, which could, would change it slightly. Um, but I'm not sure it would be an impact on the Pinkerton contract on the minimums. Okay. Uh, Al? First of all, understand that the minimums are determined based upon a three-year average. And there is a clause in the contract uh, that should that change drastically for some reason, we have the option to uh, go into that contract and make some changes. So it's, it's not written in stone for 10 years. We do have an option in there. Um, we ha you have to understand that because we're sending 90-some students there as opposed to about 38 or so to Manchester, one of the problems is that if you're going to get 90 students, you have to have some idea of what your staffing needs are going to be and what your costs are going to be. And so that was something that we negotiated with Pinkerton so that uh, they would they have the ability to know, be able to provide, be sure they can provide for our students. And so it's a two-way street. Uh, yes, it's based upon an average, and so if they don't do the job and our average drops down, that, that, uh, we, that we can negotiate a lower, a lower field figure with them. Uh, but at the same time, it's extremely important to them that they can build the appropriate buildings, they can have the appropriate number of infrastructure, and they can also have the appropriate number of teachers so that when our kids walk in there, uh, they're in appropriate size classes and well taken care of. So it's a two-way street, and for somebody, and those two are our anchor schools will take any number of our students, we need, they need to have that kind of information, and that was a minimum requirement on both our parts to be sure that our students would be adequately taken care of, and yet we do have an out if, think, think, if think, this doesn't work the way we think it will. But it's a three-year average, folks. Great. All right. All right, well, we're near the end of our my questions. Um, I think what I want to do uh, now in regards to is uh, offer of closing statements for the, for the three candidates. Um, at this point, um, I'll give you uh, three minutes each. And uh, we'll start with Greg, uh, then Alan, and then Lindsay. Okay? Uh, so uh, you've got three minutes. Hey, Greg? Excellent. Well, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I am a choice for the school board. As I said before, I do have a child here. I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into the school system. Planning roots here. I've been here in 2008 to be part of the community. Uh, I really do believe in the Hooks community. Uh, I think that Hooks is a great place to live. I think it, it's definitely moving forward in the right direction. Uh, the school system is fantastic. Everybody I've ever talked to has said that the kids that are in our school system uh, love it here. They do a fantastic job. And I want to just be a part of that, keeping it going, keeping it growing, uh, and making Hooks an attractive community. All right, uh, Alan? First of all, I want to thank those of you who voted last year to provide the needed funds for education and gave me the opportunity to work on your behalf with a team of dedicated and talented school board members, great students, concerned parents, and outstanding educators. I believe the common goal of this year has been to personalized learning with a wide range of programs and initiatives focused on rigor and relevance. We expanded high school options. We introduced demanding teaching protocols, innovative technology, and student engagement in academics, health, emotional, and social issues. If you are pleased with my part in helping to achieve these goals, and agree with the direction that education is taking in Hooksit. I respectfully ask for your support on March 8th by voting for me to continue as your school board member. Thank you. All right. First off, thank you all for coming out tonight. I was more here tonight than I thought, so that's wonderful. There are so many exciting things happening. Um, through K through eight, and then with the high schools. I mean, I think 
over the past few years, we kind of lost track of all the extra stuff going on and all the fun and exciting, the new um, technology, the possibility of full day kindergarten, STEM project or program. There's just, there's so much and more will be changing as, um, you know, the government, the leadership there changes. Of course, they all will change. We'll have to change with them. Um, also, you know, I, I think the school board as a whole has come together and really work very well. They listen to the community, to the parents, to the taxpayers, to the, to the educators. So I just really would like that opportunity to keep that positive momentum going and um, just hope I have the opportunity. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so that concludes the uh, candidate forum. Uh, I'd like to give a round of applause for our three candidates.